Regina Holocaust Library. Um, I'm Barbara Warner, the senior curator at the library, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here tonight for this uh, fascinating book talk. Um, so we've got an audience in person and online, so hello to both of our um, audiences. Um, so delighted to welcome Simon Parkin here tonight to talk about his fantastic new book, The Island of Extraordinary Captives, which I'm sure many of you have noticed has been you know, widely reviewed and widely um, praised. So we're, we're really lucky to have this event at the, the library tonight. Um, and obviously it's, it's a very appropriate subject um, for the library, which is the world's oldest collection of material on the Nazi era and the Holocaust. Um, but also the library has extensive collections of material to do with the experiences of Jewish refugees to Britain. So we currently have on show um, an exhibition put together mainly by um, one of our partners, Claire Weissenberg, and this is about the Kitchener camp, um, which is a sort of different uh, story of internment from the one that Simon covers. But the library has in its collections a lot of relevant documentation about uh, internment amongst many other things. So Simon will be giving a talk about the book and then there'll be a chance for some questions at the end. Um, and Lara, who's doing our tech tonight, will pass many questions that anyone online wants to pose. So you have, uh, if you're in person, you have, um, you should have a, a little document here which tells you how to get a discount on the book if you'd like to um, buy it. And Lara will post that in the online chat as well for those online. Um, so to introduce Simon, he is an award-winning British writer and investigative journalist. He is the author of A Game of Birds and Wolves, and this is a film that has been optioned by um, Steven Spielberg, and he lives in West Sussex. So I'll hand you over now to Simon for his talk. Thanks very much. Welcome, everyone. Um, yeah, it's lovely to be out in person. I haven't given a talk in real life for a while, so this is good. Although, welcome to everyone who's watching online as well, of course. Um, so one spring, a few years ago, I was leafing through a beige folder in the reading room of the National Archives, uh, a few miles from here, South London, uh, in search of a story. I had uh, heard about a prisoner of war camp um, in the Lake District, a converted stately home uh, that was called Grisdale Hall. Um, so many captured German sailors were sent to Grisdale Hall that it became known to locals as the U-Boat Hotel. And the image of a grand English house overrun with German POWs had captured my attention. I managed it to be a bit like Downton Abbey, but with Nazis, uh, pretty compelling juxtaposition. So I'd gone to the National Archives to uh, research British POW camps. Uh, the folder I'd requested was filled with correspondence concerning the administrative difficulties involved in moving POWs between camps, uh, pretty essential but boring war, war stuff. Uh, and I turned a page and straightened and tucked in the middle of a sheaf of papers was the front cover of what looked like a homemade newspaper. There were hand-drawn illustrations, excitable write-ups of concerts and theatrical performances, and a long, vivid description of the experience of visiting the camp post office. The text was all in English, and while it appeared to have been produced by wartime prisoners, it included an exhortation from the editor to tell everyone that you hate the Nazis. I thought, what? Like many people, I was only vaguely aware of the fact that Britain had interned Germans and Austrians during the Second World War. Uh, unlike the wartime internment of Japanese Americans in the United States, which is an episode of ongoing lament, the British internment of so-called enemy aliens has been mostly kept separate from the prevailing story Britain likes to tell itself about its wartime character. Uh, this, the camp newspaper, offered, appeared to offer a window into an unfamiliar alternate history of the war where the supposed villains were the victims and the supposed heroes the perpetrators. And so this document set me on a new path, not only to learn everything about this world, but also to discover a story who might, uh, or a person who might compel me through it. Uh, Hilda Marchant was star reporter for the Daily Express, and she first heard the story from a sailor. Two nights earlier, he explained, he had been standing on the deck of his ship and watched as a confetti of parachutes drifted into Rotterdam Harbour. 
dangling from each silhouetted disc. The sailor insisted were German sailor, sailor soldiers dressed uh, not in Nazi uniforms, but in skirts and blouses. Each uh, carried a submachine gun. When the paratroopers landed, men and women who were working as cleaners and servants were said to have emerged from basements and back doors wearing German uniforms. And these individuals, the witness said, had come to Holland claiming to be refugees from Nazi oppression, but were in fact sleeper agents posing as asylum seekers. On the 13th of May 1940, uh, two days after the invasion of the Netherlands began, the Daily Express published Hilda's story under the headline, Germans dropped women parachutists as decoys. Peppered throughout the story was the term fifth columnist. Uh, Marchant was one of the first people to adopt this phrase, which was coined during the 1936 Spanish Civil War as shorthand for traitors poised to support an enemy invasion from within. Uh, British newspapers had begun to refer to fifth columnists after the German invasion of Norway in April 1940, uh, when reports circulated that spies had been installed in the country to aid the German invasion. And so by the time Marchant's story ran, there wasn't a reader in Britain unaware of the term, its meaning or the notion that a similar network of duplicitous immigrants might lurk in their own towns and cities. Hilda's story, uh, story's claims of treachery were, it would later transpire, gravely exaggerated. But the image of the double-crossing immigrants proved indelible, and not only among readers of newspapers. The British envoy to the Dutch government, Sir Neville Bland, had also been in Rotterdam during the invasion. When he reached London, he drafted an eyewitness report, and he titled his, his account, Fifth Column Menace, and it was vivid and fearful. No matter how superficially charming and devoted they appear, Bland wrote, every German or Austrian in Britain is a real and grave menace. When the signal is given to invade Britain, Bland continued, there will be satellites of the monster all over the country who will at once embark on widespread sabotage and attacks on civilians. Britain, Bland concluded, cannot afford to take this risk. All Germans and Austrians at least ought to be interned at once. Bland's report was widely distributed uh, in Whitehall. A copy even reached King George VI, who summoned the Home Secretary Sir John Anderson uh, for a meeting at Buckingham Palace. He must take immediate action against political fifth columnists and other enemies of the state, he told Anderson, men and women. When the report's claims were, were then broadcast by the BBC, they had an immediate effect on the British public's attitude towards refugees, which until now had been broadly characterised by fragile tolerance. In April 1940, after the German occupation of Norway made an invasion of Britain seem possible, Colonel Henry Burton, Conservative, Conservative member for Sudbury, asked all members of the House of Commons if it would not be far better to intern all the lot and then pick out the good ones. But before May 1940, not a single person interviewed by the polling group Mass Observation suspected refugees to Britain of espionage or suggested that they should be interned. Now, however, with the news from Holland, British newspapers carried the clarion call for mass internment. Act, 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 do it now, blared a Daily Mail article by G. Ward Price on the 24th of May. All refugees should be drafted without delay to a remote part of the country and kept under strict supervision. You fail to realise, Price wrote, that every German is an agent. A widespread ignorance of the true numbers of foreigners to whom Britain had offered asylum hastened the change in public attitudes. One poll asked British citizens to estimate the number of refugees who had come to Britain from uh, Nazi Germany during the previous six years. Respondents put the number at anywhere between two and four million. The true figure was just 73,500. Hysteria had overcome logic. Most refugees spoke thickly accented English, were unaccustomed to British social norms, and would make ineffectual spies. Fifth columnists were far likely, likelier to come from the ranks of British fascists. As the politician Herbert Delaney Hughes wrote, it is lamentable how quickly people seem to have forgotten who exactly the refugees are and how it is that they came to this country. Most British citizens acknowledged the injustice inherent in mass internment, but felt that it was nevertheless an, an appropriate, justifiable measure. You can't say which is good and which is bad. 
said one respondent to a May poll, by which time half of those interviewed had come to favour the internment of all enemy aliens. Some of them is very nice people, but it's safest to pull them all in. The British police came for Peter Fleischmann in the early hours. It reminded the teenager of the Gestapo's moonlit roundups that he had narrowly avo avoided at home in Berlin. Um, at that time, two years earlier, earlier, a kindly policeman had knocked on the gates of the Auerbach orphanage where Peter lived, and on the day before Kristallnacht, warned that the Nazis were coming for him. Years earlier, Peter's parents had drowned in an accident while driving by the One Sea Lake. The couple had been writers for an anti-fascist newspaper, and Peter learned the car's steering had been tampered with, their deaths apparently an act of sabotage. Now it seemed the Gestapo wanted to wipe out the Fleischmann's only child. Peter had already quit his studies at the Royal School of Art in Berlin, so with no remaining ties, he fled to the south of the city and hid in the basement of his family's former housekeeper while the brown shirts tore through Berlin and raided his orphanage. When three weeks later, the first kinder transport was arranged to bring children out of Germany, Peter, a few weeks shy of his 17th birthday, just qualified for rescue. On the 1st of December, 1938, alongside a brood of the city's Jewish orphans, he embarked the train. Watched over by orphanage staff and a few Gestapo officers who had come to watch the children make their pioneering journey. At 5.30 in the morning of December the 2nd, 1938, two hours before sunrise, the TSS Prague cleaved the mist hanging over the water and docked at Pakistan Quay, Harwich, on the Essex coastline. I've got here some uh, footage, I think, if it will play. No, it doesn't look like it's going to play. Oh, was it? Oh, okay, sorry. Let's uh, go back, see if we can get that to play. Okay, so because Peter was on that very first kinder transport to arrive, there was the world's press there to greet them and mark the occasion. This is some raw footage of um, the children arriving. I've cut out some clips where we can see Peter. He was the sort of taller boy with the here with the art folder under his arm. This is after they've um, disembarked and they're getting on the bus that's going to take them to Dover Court holiday camp. You can see him here on the left, just looking at the camera now. And then when they arrive at the holiday uh, park, one of the first things that Peter does apparently is watch uh, some games of table tennis. So in Britain, Peter, who dreamed of becoming a professional artist, was taken in by the owners of a Manchester business that specialised in colouring old photographs of young soldiers who had died in the Great War. Uh, this couple provided him with employment and a room in their home. The hours were long and the conditions, a basement filled with rats, insalubrious. But the work was artist adjacent and might, Peter reasoned, provide the experience he needed to attend art school in England. In Whitehall, however, the debates surrounding the reports from Holland had soon derailed Peter's humble plans. Churchill, during his first cabinet meeting as prime minister, agreed to the internment of all male enemy aliens between the ages of 16 and 60, who were currently living within the seacoast counties of Britain. This protected area, as it was called, on the coastline was where in the event of a Nazi invasion, a spy could theoretically cause the most harm. Uh, men were to be in turn, regardless of the category uh, that tribunals have uh, category of risk that is uh, uh, that tribunals have bestowed on them several months earlier. The following day, on Sunday, the 12th of May, 1940, Scotland Yard's fleet of motor cars roared out of police headquarters. Many of the officers dispatched to make the day's arrests had been unaware of their task until they arrived at work that morning. By the end of this first mass roundup, around 2,000 refugees had been taken into custody and handed to the military authorities for internment. The Home Secretary, John Anderson, was opposed to mass internment, a position that he hoped to hold, he wrote, unless the war begins to go badly. Earlier in the year, he wrote to his father of the danger posed to justice by national paranoia. In wartime, he wrote, people are easily worked up. 
a spy scare can be started at any time as a stunt. Now with German troops in France, the threat of an enemy invasion looming, and newspapers stewing with reports of fifth columnists, Anderson was forced to concede that there were various bodies and groups of persons in this country against whom action would need to be taken, including refugees. Throughout May, the protected area expanded from coastal counties inland, from Devon to Dorset, Mersey to Cheshire, until no one in Britain was safe from the threat of immediate arrest and indefinite internment based on their nationality, ethnicity, religion, or political beliefs. Internment was in the best interest of the internee, Churchill argued, since public temper meant such persons would be in great danger if left at liberty. This argument precisely echoed that made by the Nazi officials to justify the arrest of the party's political opponents years earlier. In a speech delivered in March 1933, shortly after the opening of Dachau, the first Nazi concentration camp, Heinrich Himmler reasoned, I felt compelled to make these arrests because in many parts of the city there's been so much agitation that it has been impossible for me to guarantee the safety of those particular individuals who have provoked it. For those men who had survived and fled the Nazi concentration camps at Dachau and Buchenwald, now interned by their supposed, supposed liberators, it was a befuddling injustice. Having allowed the popular press to whip up jingoism and hatred, instead of taking an enlightened lead, the government now used public opinion as a justification for strict measures. Among Londoners, some sort of neurosis had taken grip, Klaus Hinrichsen noted. Anyone who was German was considered a Nazi. As we're saying, actually, Hinrichsen, uh, Hinrichsen had first-hand experience of this. Uh, he, was, uh, he was arrested after a neighbour heard the uh, knocking of his bed when he was making love to his girlfriend and thought it might be a coded message. Um, <laughs> on Sunday, the 4th of June, Churchill addressed the House of Commons to announce the government's new powers to put down fifth column activities with a strong hand. Churchill acknowledged that the orders would affect a great many people who are passionate enemies of Nazi Germany. But there was, he said, nothing to be done. I'm very sorry for them, but we cannot draw all the distinctions we would like to. Status and class, those twin armaments of privilege, provided little protection. Nazism had pushed a wave of luminaries towards Britain. Now these Oxbridge dons, surgeons, dentists, lawyers and celebrated artists were taken into custody. The police arrested Emil Goldman, a 67-year-old professor from the University of Vienna in the grounds of Eton College. At Cambridge University, dozens of staff and students were detained in the Guildhall, including, including Prince Frederick of Prussia, a grandson of Queen Victoria. That year's Cambridge Law Finals nearly had to be cancelled because one of the intern professors had locked away the exam papers and taken the key with him. In the early hours of the 5th of July, a black Mariah pulled up at the prestige home of Albert and Gertrude Ripkin, who had taken in Peter Fleischmann and given him work. Peter awoke to the sound of knocking. The officer's instruction was curt and urgent. Get your clothes, come with us. Neither soldier nor criminal, Peter, one of 90 refugees arrested by Salford police that morning, was denied the civil rights that even convicts enjoy. No charge, no trial, no bail. None of his story mattered, not the fact he had been orphaned and made homeless by the Nazi regime, not the fact he had been brought to England, a destitute child, nor that he had been carefully interviewed by Lord Chief Justice Rainer Goddard, one of the most senior judges in the land and deemed to pose no security risk to his adoptive country. In this new reality, subject to the British government's panicked measures, only Peter's nationality, the same nationality the Nazis hoped to strip from all German and Austrian Jews, mattered. Buffeted along a twisted road by the winds of history, he was once again unwelcome and homeless. Peter, like many of those arrested in northwest England, first arrived at a transit camp known as Wharf Mills. Massive, decaying, derelict cotton mill that cast a brutish silhouette on the Lancashire horizon. Its proprietors had been forced by recession to abandon the premises ten years earlier. Uh, the floor was a mixture of cobbles and wood, and it was viscid and slippery with old machine oil, the smell of which mixed with the acrid stench of the canal that ran alongside the building. Transmission belts hung like nooses from rafters, and broken panes of glass let the rain in. 
The building, which was three stories tall at one section, had set, sat empty and dampening until the British Army moved in on the 5th of June. The first internees arrived just seven days later. They had ample time to take in their new home. From Berry Station, the internees were marched four miles along Manchester Road. It was a walk of shame. Hostile onlookers watched the men as they were paraded in front of the public as prisoners. To be marched like a bloody prisoner of war with people watching, that really hurt, recalled Peter Katz, a pastor in his mid-50s, who had been one of the first arrivals. I felt degraded. By the time Peter arrived, Wharf Mills was packed. Inside, British soldiers under the command of a retired officer, Major Alfred Braybrook, sat behind a row of tables ready to check the men's belongings. The internees lined up behind ropes. Each man smelled the stench of disinfectant while he waited to be called forward. On Peter's turn, a private grabbed his bag and tipped the contents onto a table while a seated officer thumbed through his wallet. Peter assumed the men were searching for any items that could be used as weapons, but it soon became clear that anything of value was to be confiscated. Just as the Nazis had robbed many of these men of their valuables, so the British officers now took chocolate, cigarettes, writing paper and typewriters, distributing these items among, uh, among themselves in full view of the looted. The breach of privacy revealed not only what each internee had considered sufficiently important to bring during the harried moments of his arrest, but also the range of vocations represented. Doctors watched as soldiers pocketed their stethoscopes. Academics argued they should be allowed to keep their textbooks, while artists pleaded to hang on to their drawing paper. For many of the men, this ransacking crowned a brief period that had transformed their view of Britain and their place within it. We went around breathing injustice and feeling very sore about all kinds of things, wrote Hirsch Uri, who was arrested alongside a member, a number of other young uh, Orthodox Jews, most of whom had come to England via the kinder transport. Since gloom only serves to increase one's loquacity, we soon became unbearable to ourselves. I remember very clearly, noted Klaus Moser, who would later become chairman of the Royal Opera House, and this was the dominating thought. The feeling of insult, the whole operation was panicky and cruel. In Worth Mills, 2,000 internees shared a single bathtub and 18 water taps, a limitation that soon enough forced almost every man to give up on shaving and encouraged some to rise as early as four o'clock in the morning to avoid the rush. Laundry could be washed in an empty room, but without soap or drying facilities, clothes often emerged as dirty as before. There was no sewerage system in place and the lavatories amounted to 60 buckets housed outside beneath an oblong tent. As the day progressed, the stench became unbearable. Conditions in the camp were considered by the numerous German doctors among the inmates to be a liability for disease. They wrote and co-signed a mem memorandum of complaint to Major Braybrook. Dr. Simon Isaac, a former professor at the University of Frankfurt, who had overseen makeshift hospitals on the Russian front in the First World War, wrote that he had never seen a place less fit for the accommodation of human beings. To be imprisoned in a building not even fit for beasts, another internee wrote, had a profound effect on the men's view of the country that had offered them sanctuary. Many, he wrote, have ceased to believe in the British spirit of humanity, which before they had acclaimed. The indignities of isolation from friends and relatives, the meagre food rations, the lice, the inadequate sanitary arrangements led many internees to draw parallels between the mill and the Nazi concentration camps from which they had fled. According to a an official Ministry of Information report, two men, both of whom had previously been incarcerated in Nazi concentration camps, died at Wharf Mill by suicide. After a week spent in the mill, Peter was transported to one of the more permanent camps, 10 of which were situated on the Isle of Man, and where women and children were also interned. When he reached the island, Fleischmann's home was Pea Camp, or Hutchinson, where around 1,200 internees were billeted in requisition boarding houses that bordered a picturesque square with views leading down to Douglas Harbour. After the indignities of Wharf Mills, Hutchinson had a bucolic quality, which at times felt something akin to a holiday camp. Hutchinson opened on the 13th of July, 1940. Two days later, some men emerged from their boarding houses carrying chairs and ladders, which they set up around the terraced lawn. 
These men beckoned passers-by, and when they had a small crowd, began to hold forth on their specialist subject. Soon the lawn became filled with speakers and their various audiences, like, as one observer put it, a scene from ancient Athens. The listener could wander freely between subjects from Greek philosophy, industrial uses of synthetic fibres, to Shakespeare's sonnets. Before he transferred to Hutchinson, Bruno Ahrens, an architect who had, during his illustrious career, designed Berlin's highly influential modernist housing estates, had organised lessons for the schoolboys in his previous camp. Recognising the illustrious group of teachers in Hutchinson's midst, Ahrens approached the camp commandant, a former advertising executive named Captain Hubert Daniel, and requested permission to organise a formal schedule of lectures. Uh, Daniel, who was known as Danny to his friends, offered Ahrens a room on the first floor of the camp, um, uh, uh, of the camp's administration building. And together with his assistant, Dr. Klaus Hinrichsen, uh, young, uh, the young art historian, the pair assigned daily uh, lectures, organized theater and music performances, and most urgently arranged letter lessons and tutorials for the youngest internees to prepare them for the exams they would hopefully be able to sit upon their release. Ahrens christened the outfit, which was founded just four days after Hutchinson's opening, the cultural department. But Captain Daniel, having learned that his charges included a considerable number of eminent academics, insisted that it be known as Hutchinson Camp University. The department's remit was wide-ranging, programming lessons, arranging the borrowing of books from local and mainland libraries, the securing of art supplies and musical instruments, and the organising of teaching, uh, the, organising the teaching of English at all grades of knowledge. There were those who would endlessly play cards and poker, and some men would just smoke cigars, not moving until the next batch of food parcels would arrive. But those who chose to participate in the cultural schedule were richly rewarded. Helmut Weissenborn considered it a miracle of human willpower, how quickly the camp transformed, and transformed into a kind of university, one that was, in the lawyer turned painter Fred Ullman's estimation, the best I had ever attended. Efforts weren't limited to academic pursuits. Captain Daniel pr uh, proved to be a benevolent overseer. At the urging of his frustrated artist wife, Daniel, himself a keen photographer, provided materials and studio space for the artists in the camp, and even hired in a grand piano for an outdoor matinee performance by the intern musician Marjan Ravitz. While many of the celebrated artists in the camp produced and exhibited works of art across many disciplines, the journalists um, uh, published a fortnightly camp newspaper which featured news, articles, fiction and illustrations, all edited by Leo Freund using the pen name Michael Corvin. In London, campaigners such as the MP Eleanor Rathbone, uh, Helen Rota, secretary of the Artist Refugee Committee, and the self-effacing Quaker Bertha Bracey secured for the internees books that enabled them to open an impromptu library where Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland and Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca proved to be the most borrowed titles. They also secured for the internees a tennis table, uh, a table tennis table, and in time a shop where the internees could buy supplies and even alcohol. Uh, many of those organisations, of course, worked out of Bloomsbury House, which is about a two-minute walk that way. There were dozens of clubs for special interests, including ones for Spanish, French and Norwegian speakers, the Collegio Dante for fans of the Italian poet, and an English section run by the journalist Ludwig Elster for those who wish, wish to become better acquainted with English life and its institutions. There were professional actors and film directors in the camp who staged productions of, among others, The Midsummer Night's Dream and of Mice and Men. In all areas of theatrical production, ingenuity had to compensate for deficiency. Some of the technical-minded members of the group fashioned stage lights out of old jam jars, which had a silvery reflective surface uh, on the inside. In lieu of a dimmer switch, the stagehands were co uh, connected a strip of additional light bulbs to the same circuit, which was kept on the wings out of sight, and the brightness of the stage lives could be adjusted by screwing and unscrewing additional bulbs into the circuit, enabling the lighting team to create the effect of a sunrise or a sunset. 
Repre representatives of the technical school installed a speaker system throughout the camp. This was co-designed by Dr. Hans Rothfels from St. John's College, College, Oxford, and it consisted of 2,700 yards of wire, which fed 53 speakers in each house's dining room. Uh, this enabled the broadcast of radio programmes from the BBC, and soon internees were using the radio system to bro broadcast their own talks, English lessons, and even entertainment that's specially written uh, inside the camp. Occasionally, vinyl records were played in lieu of an evening concert, and the system also enabled Captain Daniel to relay messages from his desk to the entire camp. Uh, Daniel warmed to his role and would routinely announce the latest cricket scores to the bewildered European internees. Sometimes tipsy from afternoon drinks, he would address the men in garbled officers' English that many of his prisoners struggled to pass. The artists in the camp soon established a semi-exclusive artist's cafe, which was housed in the laundry room extension of House 19. With its whitewashed walls and bubbling paint, water taps and washboards, uh, the venue lacked the sophistication of the continental cafes uh, that the men were used to, but the room was sizable and when some trellis tables, chairs and stools had been arranged inside, provided a relatively comfortable space for meetings, conversation and poetry recitals. Is a list of some of the members of the Artist Cafe. For Peter Fleischmann, who had no ties to the outside world, Hutchison provided the artistic education that had been robbed from him by the Nazis. Shortly after his arrival in the camp, he spotted a strange looking artist sitting in the corner of the square. He watched as the man stopped people while they walked past and offered to sketch their portrait in as little as five minutes for a fee. As commercially efficient as a Leicester Square caricaturist, the man priced his portraits on a sliding scale, three pounds for a head and shoulders, four for head, shoulders and arms, and five, for a half, five pounds for a half figure. When someone informed Peter that the man in the loden coat was the famed Dadaist Kurt Schwitters, he was somewhat surprised at the straightforwardness of the portraits, but immediately signed up for a life drawing lesson hosted by Schwitters. Uh, which was among, uh, popular among those who wished to learn how to paint or who merely wanted a closer look at the celebrity. Under Schwitter's guidance, Peter painted still life can canvases depicting items in his immediate vicinity, his shoes, his knife, his fork, plate and flowers. He continued his work outside the lessons, painting on, the hard on hardcover panels torn from books on loan from the camp library. The sculptors Paul Haman and George Ehrlich showed him how to smuggle clay dug while out on an escorted walk in the local hills back into the camp and how to remove the sand uh, and, and to use it for casting clay. The woodcarver Ernst Müller-Blensdorf, who you can see here, showed Fleischmann how to sculpt blocks of firewood. I had always wanted to paint and here was the opportunity, uh, Peter later recalled. I had a chance at last to learn from morning to night every day. Peter was a quick learner and when his painting of his shoes won first prize in a camp art competition, he soon caught the attention of the older artists. I shared the conviction of the other artists that here was a natural talent, a born artist who just could not stop himself from working and learning. In November 1940, the artists staged a major exhibition in the camp, timed to coincide with the opening of a new hall building, which had been built next to the camp laundry and above the canteen, a generously sized venue that could house musical and theatrical performances, as well as indoor sporting events. It was Klaus Hinrichsen's privilege and burden to choose which works by which artists could be shown, while ensuring that the space did not become overcrowded. Um, all without bruising the delicate egos of the competing artists who were, when it came to exhibitions, used to having things their own way. It was, in short, a nightmare, as Hinrichsen wrote. No artist is ever satisfied with the number of his works accepted, nor with the space where they are shown. But for Peter, the event presented an opportunity to produce and exhibit work alongside many of, U of Europe's finest artists, an unimaginable prospect outside the camp's warped reality. Four of his works were chosen for display. And on Tuesday, the 19th of November, at four o'clock in the afternoon, Captain Daniel entered the exhibition trailed by an entourage. Peter proudly stood beside his work. 
it was an enjoyable day for the artist, though on some level it must have thrown the extent to which their professional horizons had shrunk into perspective. Men who had exhibited in Berlin's finest galleries were reduced now to jostling for wall space in a remote island boarding house. Peter's experience was the exception. Here was the tangible fulfillment that to him captivity represented an expansion of opportunity. Despite the cultural richness of the camp, depression was rife as the men waited for news of their loved ones, worried about their businesses and obsessed over freedom. Lest all this sounds too rosy a situation, Klaus Hendrickson wrote, let me assure you that all these frantic activities were entered into as a means of distraction from the ever-present anger at the injustice, the constant worry about wives and children left without a provider, from the lack of communication and, of course, suffering from cramped living conditions and the lack of freedom. In the autumn of 1940, the government released a white paper that outlined several categories under which internees could apply for release. Those who were too young or too old, too infirm, or who already had permits to work in positions of national importance could apply to be freed. Artists, writers, and musicians were not included until later revisions, and even then had to prove that they had achieved distinction in their chosen field. As Helen Rota, Secretary of the Artists' Refugee Committee, put it to the Director of the National Gallery, do you think the criteria could be stretched to include the poor souls who have been too busy being hunted to achieve distinction in the arts? In Whitehall, attitudes to mass internment had shifted, hastened by the news of the sinking of the SS Arundora Star, when 650 men, including German and Austrian refugees who had been deported to Canadian internment camps, were drowned after a U-boat torpedoed their liner. It was a shipping disaster with one of the gravest losses of life of the Second World War. The economist John Maynard Keynes, an advisor to the government, claimed that he had not met a single soul inside or outside government departments who is not furious at what is going on. Undoing the mess, however, was proving time-consuming and complex. In the early months of internment, the fact that so many brilliant men of self-evidently anti-Nazi beliefs had been interned highlighted the absurdity of the situation. But as the autumn nights drew in, uh, any sense of perverse delight clotted into dismay and bitterness, as one by one the camp emptied of uh, its celebrated individuals. The weeks until Christmas and after seemed to be just one endless gloom and depression, Fred Ullman wrote. Every day I waited in fear and hope until five o'clock when the names of the released were announced, only to crawl back to my room, too miserable to eat. Schwitters, for all his creative output and commercial success, experienced pendulous mood swings. Haven't I lost enough, he mourned in one poem. In another, written for his wife, he describes the grim monotony of his life. I am a prisoner. The days and the long nights fly bleakly past, always the same people whom I don't hate, don't love. By March 1941, 12, 12 and a half thousand internees had walked free, representing almost half of those who had been interned the previous summer. On October the 7th, 1941, one year, two months and 25 days after he arrived at Hutchinson, Peter Fleischmann shook the commandant's hand and bade him farewell. The Artists' Refugee Committee had finally found him a place at Beckenham Art College, where Peter was reunited with some of his camp mentors, such as Helmut Weissenborn, who had taken up a teaching post there. Toward the end of the war, Peter became a translator for the British Army and returned first to the Wharf Mills holding camp and then, at the end of hostilities, to Berlin. There he visited the Auerbach orphanage, which had been returned, turned to rubble during an Allied bombing raid in the winter of 1943. The destruction of this orphanage had begun much earlier, however. On October the 19th, 1942, the 21st East Transport carried almost 60 Auerbach children, aged between 2 and 16, along with three of their carers, to Latvia. In the nearby forest, SS officers executed each member of the group. And then the following month, the remaining Auerbach children left Berlin on the 23rd East Transport. This train went to Auschwitz, and none survived. After the war, everything of which Peter had dreamed since he was a young, aspiring artist at the orphanage would come true. 
Under his adopted name, Peter Midgley, he was accepted into the Royal College of Art, where he graduated with first class honours, the top fine art student in his year, awarded with the RCA's prestigious Rome Scholarship. He became a, a professional artist, securing commissions to create works for British government departments, for Oxford, Warwick and York universities and the Royal Navy. Nothing bettered the training he received at Hutchinson, however. Everything thereafter, he later said, was just a recap. While the internees had been relatively comfortable, internment was a near constant misery for most, one that, as the Oxford academic Paul Jacobsthal wrote, caused a trauma. At least 56 internees died in internment on the Isle of Man, many to suicide. And while Peter Midgley's life was transformed by the people he, people he met during his internment, um, the episode also triggered feelings of abandonment that haunted his dreams. Once or twice a year, he would experience the same recurring nightmare. He was back in the camp. Everyone around him was released until finally he was the last one there, permanently forsaken. Every government must balance its humanitarian obligations with the need to uphold national security. To categorize refugees from Nazi oppression as enemy aliens, however, was to invite scorn and hatred upon those most in need of compassion and represented a moral failing on a national scale. Few went as far as Tristan Bush, a former internee who described the policy as a war crime, but it is indisputable that the hasty measures heaped unhappiness and anguish upon thousands of people already enduring the ordeal of fleeing their previous lives. Only a single sentence spoken by Sir John Anderson in the House of Commons on the 22nd of August, 1940, many months before most of Hutchinson's, Hutchinson's internees were freed, provided something approaching an apology. Regrettable and deplorable things have happened, he said, as if the cruelties of internment had been the result of natural phenomena and not a series of deliberate choices. In May last year, the Canadian Prime Minister, Justin, Justin Trudeau issued a formal apology to the 32,000 Italian Canadians who were declared enemy aliens during the Second World War, 600 of whom were sent to internment camps there. There's been no equivalent attempt to repair the damage by the British authorities in failing to distinguish between refugees and enemy aliens, itself a dehumanizing term that last year the US government pledged never again to use. The battle between a nation's responsibility to help those in need and to maintain national security persists in every age and every generation. But the notion of a refugee who is not who he or she claims to be is an enduring story that can be easily used to justify institutional cruelty or overreach. While the context and detail shifts, the debate remains the same. Every successive generation wants to answer the question how far can we go in the rightful defense of our values before we abandon them along the way? Peter was just one individual in a camp that at its most populous numbered more than 1,200 captives, each man with his own history and legacy. And Hutchinson was just one of dozens of camps around Britain, Canada and Australia, the combined total of internees stretching into the tens of thousands. Of course, most of these men were not professors at world famous universities or musicians summoned to play for royalty or artists who had exhibited across European galleries. Hutchinson's population was much like any other random cross section of society, a mixture of factory workers and artisans, teachers and intellectuals, doctors, mechanics, builders and chefs. And yet placed in these unusual circumstances, this ordinary cross section of society achieved the extraordinary. Together, they turned a prison into a university, a camp into a cultural center, a boarding house into an art gallery, a jumble of wires into a broadcasting station, a lawn into an amphitheater. Hutchinson became a microcosm of civilization and the extraordinariness lay not in the accolades of each individual captive, but in how, as a collective, they embodied humanity's better urges, even while besieged by its baser ones. Thank you very much. So, um, thank you very much, Simon. That was fantastic. Um, really interesting and fascinating, and um, lots of interesting images as well to look at. Um, 
So yeah, we've got a bit of time for questions. Um, in order to make sure that the um, online audience can hear any questions, I might repeat your question, Mr. So. Um, but yes, any questions from the audience here? Yes. So we've got a question um, from the audience here asking um, what Hutchinson campus is now, whether it was turned back to the boarding houses that it has been. And this is from someone in the audience whose father was interned there. Uh, yeah, so it's it looks identical now to how it did before. It's a square, Hutchinson Square is an actual square of, um, of houses, boarding houses, many of which are still boarding houses where you can go and stay. Uh, the lawn, look, I was there a few weeks ago, uh, the lawn is still terraced in the middle. It looks slightly different, there's more trees than in those photos we saw. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, you can go there and it looks the same. The only thing that is different is the hall, hall that I mentioned that was built uh, was at some point knocked down and new houses built there. In fact, it was it was knocked down. It was sold and knocked down two years, I think, after the end of hostilities. OK, I've got some questions online as well, but I'll um, come back to questions in the audience in a, in a moment. Um, so there's a question um, asking um, whether the, you know, there were re there were sort of German and Austrian Nazis in in the camps, um, and how did the sort of two groups interact with each other? Yeah, so the subtitle of the book is "You See the True Story of an Artist, a Spy, and a Wartime Scandal." I haven't covered the spy bit in this talk, uh, but a large component of the the book is. Um, an MI5 investigation into one of the internees in the camp was, who was suspected of uh, being a Gestapo plant. Um, the number of Nazi sympathizers in Hutchinson was minimal. Uh, it was mainly predominantly uh, category C risk uh, internees, which is the lowest possible risk. Um, that was not the case in each of the 10 camps on the island. Um, in particular, the, the women's camps, um, Russian, uh, they hit, there were two camps on the on the seafront at Port Erin, and uh, the, it was a major scandal there because many Jewish women and children were put in the same houses as Nazi sympathizing women. So it was, it, it was debated in the House of Commons, it came up lots, the, the campaigners that I mentioned in the talk uh, you know, that were obviously trying to say, please, can you separate uh, these individuals? And it was very miserable for anyone in that situation. Uh, Peveril camp is worth, worth, worth um, mentioning as well, which was in Peel on the Isle of Man. And this is where the highest risk uh, internees were, were kept. And that included uh, not only suspected Nazi sympathizers, but also members of the British Union and of fascists and members of the IRA as well. So um, just a sort of um, slight adaptation of a, a question that's been asked online, perhaps you could comment on the extent to which you think this this story is unknown, perhaps the, the story in general of um, internees in Britain, and then specifically the story of, of the Hutchinson camp. Well, I think for people who, who know about internment, Hutchinson is probably the best known of camps because it had uh, the, uh, the, the best known internees there and had this rich cultural life I've talked about. Um, so uh, um, uh, in in general terms, I think the for anyone whose family, whose grandparents were interned, obviously it's not a mystery. It's not new to them. Uh, but I think in the you know to the perhaps the and and for residents on the Isle of Man as well, of course, are, are deeply aware of internment during both both world wars. Uh, but yes, I would say here in in Great Britain, it's perhaps not something that we have shouted about. It it's a story that uh, runs contrary to the the um, prevailing narrative of Britain as a just nation, fighting the personification of evil, which of course is all true. But what is also true is that there was this uh, rather dark uh, period uh, in which grave injustices were committed against people who should never have been interned. These distinctions should have been made between uh, genuine refugees and enemy aliens, and it could have saved a great deal of misery and some lives as well. 
Um, in terms of the, my book specifically, which elements are, uh, uh, have not been told before, I think, well, you know, there's a lot of research into Peter's story, uh, and, and that's developed in, in a lot more detail inside the book. The story of the spy Ludwig Vorschauer, who set up the technical school, that you saw the picture, um, those, the, the folders relating to his MI5 case were released uh, via Freedom of Information Act um, recently, uh, and, but I don't think it's not, not being told in any particular detail before. Uh, and I also managed to track down the uh, son of the lead investigator into that case um, as well. So there's, there's, uh, there's a large amount of new sources that, that have enabled me to tell the story in this way. Uh, you know, not least from from families who have given me access to diaries and things that are not already in um, archives, such as here at the library. Um, so we've got a question asking whether there were attempts by the Jewish community in Britain um, to try and influence political decision makers about this policy and um, alleviate the plight of internees. Yeah, well, so in the very early weeks when in the sort of darkest time of May 1940, in fact, members of the, the Jewish leaders were broadly in favour of internments, I think perhaps thinking that it was perhaps, um, perhaps coming in line with some of the things that were said by Churchill about this is this is the best way to keep people safe. And I think as well, not wanting to look antagonistic and all of that, but that, that, that attitude rapidly changes uh, and not only among the Jewish aid organizations but also among the popular press you know with the story in, in fact you can read about it here uh, in the current exhibition uh, which is all about one of the internment another internment camp Kitchener so as soon as the I mentioned the disaster of the Arundel star um, most scandalously shortly after uh, there is another another ship this time sent off to australia the hmt dunera um, a large number of those who had survived the sinking of the arandora star are promptly put on this ship and sent off again and uh, there was appalling treatment by uh, the refugees in that ship uh, by the british uh, soldiers many of whom later face court martial uh, and when the reports of this starts to circulate i think people there's a there's a widespread outcry but of course um, it's much easier to to lock people up than it is to release them so that takes a very long time thank you so um any other questions in the audience at the moment yes was there an so this is a question asking whether there was any action taken after the scandal at Wharf Mills. Yeah, so I mentioned Major Alfred Braybrook. He was the retired major who was brought in to run that camp. He also, prior to that, uh, ran um, Kempton Park Racecourse Camp, which was a very early transit camp. Uh, he is held to account for the action, his own actions and, and the actions of his soldiers and was court-martialed and goes to prison uh, for, for what happened. He stole... Uh, Kirchfitter's son's typewriter. Um, I think one of the worst things he did, actually, that I don't mention here is that he, in order to occupy the internees at Wharf Mills, he says, you know, write out your petitions and give them to me and I'll pass them on to the government. And then when they come in, he just bins them. So, uh, you know, ter terrible behaviour. But he, he was, he did face consequences. Question, which is um, it, it, it came out of a discussion actually a few of us were having at, at the in the library on Friday when we had some training about oral history methods and often internees decades later when giving testimonies or accounts of their experiences weren't all that negative and said things like oh well I understand the British had to do what they had to do and um, you know I don't really mind and I was fine and you know that sort of thing so you you gave us i think um it's completely right this this sort of picture of how horrendous this policy was but i just wondered if you could comment on the sort of perhaps the difference between how internees saw things at the time and how they chose to present that years later or anything like that yeah i think there are a few reasons for that um and yes, in fact, so some of the individuals I mentioned here, Fred Ullman uh, edits his diaries at three points in his lifetime to soften them. Uh, 
Paul Jakobstal, who wrote that uh, he had endured a trauma after he is released. He then rewrites his diary to distribute among his Oxford friends, and he's downgraded all of that stuff and sort of talks a bit about how it was a rather nice time. Um, that's why I think it's important to go to the primary sources that were written at the time, the letters, the diaries, because it gives a true sense of the internee's psychological state. The reason it, there, there are lots of incentives for the internees to soften their view of internment in later years. For one, many of them choose to make their lives here in Britain and uh, you know, they change their names from their German and Austrian variants to more English sounding names. They want to assimilate wherever possible. It's in their interest not to complain too much. And then, of course, it's not really until after the war that we realised the full extent of the horrors of the Holocaust. And I think when those details start coming out via the Nuremberg trials and, and thereafter, um, it, softens, it, it softens the view of internment because fundamentally in Germany, um, Jewish people and, and others were sent to concentration camps out of hatred. In Britain, they were sent to internment camps out of fear. That's an important distinct and a meaningful distinction. But of course, I don't think it, it means that we can't, you know, it's not, it's not, well, this is much worse, so we can't talk about this as well. So I think it's the job of um, you know, historians and writers to, to try and write things as they were perceived at the time. Thank you. So I think, we've, yes, we've got a question there. So for those online, the question is, was internment an anti-Semitic policy? Yeah, that's a very big and difficult question <laughs> to answer. I mean, the, the tangible effects of the policy were fundamentally anti-Semitic, right? There's no denying that because it um, disproportionately uh, punished Jewish people. 80% of those in turn were, were Jewish. Was it motivated by anti-Semitism? I think perhaps it's just less easy to give a definitive answer in that. Peter and Lenny Gilman, who wrote uh, a sort of really important book on internment in the 70s, I believe, uh, called Collar the Lot, they wrote a letter in The Guardian saying that they didn't, they didn't see any evidence that it was anti-Semitism uh, that was fueling the internment policy. But what is also true is that the general atmosphere in Britain at the time was anti-Semitic, you know, and that, and that was at all strata of society. So, and, and, and all across the political spectrum as well, because on the, the left, there was fear of, Im of Jewish immigrants coming in and taking jobs. So the trade unions were very uh, opposed to uh, allowing refugees in. And then, you know, we know what the right would think. And um, so, yeah, it, it's just very difficult to definitively come da down one, one way or another. But I think it's fair to say that anti-Semitism anti was in the atmosphere and that the tangible effects of the policy uh, had that effect. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, no, that's that's true. Yeah, but uh, yes, and yeah, no, yeah, yes. I suppose it's just to what degree was that to do with their Jewishness, and to what degree was it just we don't want any refugees here? Which, of course, is a question that uh, hasn't gone away. <laughs> There's any final question from the audience here? I have one final question online. Um, so, the, yeah, the final question online um, essentially um, asks um, whether you've thought about doing research into kind of other camps in the Isle of Man with cultural activities. And I suppose I thought, if if not, you could perhaps tell us what you're looking to look into next. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think for for particularly for people who had family members that were in other camps, they might feel a bit like, well, why have you chosen Hutchinson? That's not fair. And uh, I mean, the mode in which I work is as a narrative nonfiction writer rather than a general broad historian. So I'm looking to tell a, a story that's contained in some way. And I had to set some boundaries for my narrative and Hutchinson provided those. But of course, there were, um, there were cultural activities throughout all of the camps, including Kitchener, as you can read about 
um, here on the on the boards. Um, uh, Yes, it, I mean, it, you could talk a l <laughs> endlessly about the, the other things that were put on. There were plays put on in others. There were, there were musicians uh, in the other camps as well, uh, as well as uh, artists and a great amount of, large amount of art produced. So, uh, but Hutchinson just appealed to me for various reasons. But of course, I wanted to tell uh, Peter's story, which I think is sort of, you know, and, and this was the camp he was in. And it, his story was interesting to me because it's, you know, it's sort of, avoids a bit of you know the moral certainties because for him of course internment was a was a great propeller for everything that happened later in his life so it's complicated much like the the broader story um in terms of my next book uh it's uh i'm moving on from internment but uh i'm planning to write a book about russia <laughs> and i was planning to go to st petersburg in may which is not happening now obviously um so we'll see we'll see what happens with that but yes i'm writing a book about the siege of leningrad so So timely, I think, really, <laughs> it turns out, unfortunately. Um, so um, thank you so much to Simon for a fantastic uh, talk and answering all your questions. Thank you to the audience for the questions. Um, I think we'll be putting a recording of this event online soon. And uh, we hope to see you all at future Vena Library events. So if you'd like to join me in thanking Simon again. <laughs>